man, it is raining something fierce right now. You get double blessed for coming to the first service when it's raining hard and it sounds like we're in a hornet's nest right now. <clears throat> we do prevail double portion on you and your family and your house in Jesus' name. Well, like I mentioned earlier, we are in a series, the very first series of all time here at our church called Living Vivid. And the entire series is what this church is founded on, which our vision statement is the primary reason that the series is even happening. And that vision statement is simply this. We exist to lead people into the vivid story that God has for them. Period. I believe your story is of the utmost importance, and I believe that every person's story gets better when Jesus gets involved. I believe your story has the power to impact, shape, change, influence the world, and I believe God is desperately trying to get involved in our stories. That comes directly from the key verse of this church, which is this, 2 Peter 1.16 says, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, Peter is saying, we didn't follow all these lies that we made up. We didn't get in the room and try to concoct the way the story would turn out, and make it really interesting. We didn't romanticize the past. We didn't embellish it. We simply followed Jesus and we told the stories that happened while we were following him and it changed the world. The reason that we have, this is our vision statement, is because I'm convinced, I'm convinced that the only thing that you will carry into heaven with you is the story that you tell. That's it. That's the only thing theologically when I read this book that I can even come up with. I am on a mission to make sure that every story told in heaven is vivid. That's it. I believe that he can write a better beginning, middle, and ending for your story than you could. I believe he's got plot twists that are waiting for you just around the corner. And I believe that he is going to write a story that will blow your mind if you continually walk and follow it out. Amen. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. He's wanting to write a better story for us, and I believe when we live on mission for him, quite simply to encase everything I just articulated in the last five minutes in two words, I call it living vivid. Living vivid, baby. That's what we're doing, and I believe that is the mission of the church. Because of all that, if you've missed certain uh, portions of this series, you can tune in uh, in the archives online. You can watch the first three parts, but I want to bring you the fourth part today that I believe is essential for your life. We've talked about many different things, but today I believe this next one is going to be uh, really powerful. So Mark 8 verses 22 through 25. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. If you're not ready, say, hold up. That's a good sign. I didn't hear from anybody to say, hold up. So, oh, I'm excited about these verses. Mark 8, 22 through 25. Hear these words of our Father. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. His eyes were open. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Okay, I want to give you one more verse before we break into all of this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Two definitions I want to give you, faith and grace. Faith is this, defined in Hebrews, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It is the substance of things unseen. Faith is this organic belief that is innate inside of us. You can't touch it or feel it or or, or necessarily see it, but you know when somebody has faith and you know when somebody has lost faith. You know what I'm talking about? Faith, the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things unseen. Grace defined is simply this, the freely given, unmerited favor and divine enablement by God to us. These two pillars, they, they kind of work and coincide. They're like spaghetti and meatball, if you will. I want to help by ironing this out as best I can by showing you what I mean by grace. Because grace is an, uh, an interesting subject that a lot of us we can't really put anything to it. It's, a, it's an ethereal concept. It's not necessarily a, a practical step you take, okay? So here's what I want to I talk about. Sin is simply this defined. Sin is missing the mark, okay? Sin is missing the mark and breaking the law. If I'm going 100 miles an hour down the road in my vehicle and I am speeding in a 55-mile-an-hour zone, that would be breaking the law. I'd be missing the mark, right? I would be sinning. We're on the same page. Okay. In this scenario, let's say that I get pulled over. The second term that I want to throw at you is a term that we all love called justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. Okay, so you sin, you, 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 you break the law, you miss the mark. Police officer comes over to you. Justice for breaking the speed limit is receiving a what? A ticket, right, okay. Mercy is the third concept I want to throw at you. Mercy is this, not getting what you deserve. So if justice is getting what you deserve, mercy would be not getting what you deserve, meaning the police officer would stand at your car and say, I have no idea why you're going 100 miles an hour down the road, and that's wrong. You, you broke the law, but I'm not going to serve justice right now. I'm going to show mercy. We're all on the same page. Okay. Grace is where everything gets completely jacked up. But there's two versions of grace. There's cheap grace and then there's scandalous grace. Cheap grace would be like this. Same scenario, you break the law, you sin. He not only shows you mercy, but the officer says, this is cheap grace. I'm going to give you a ticket because you broke the law. Okay? Here's a hundred bucks for breaking the law. And you'd be like, why are you paying for the ticket? Well, because I want to show you Grace, I want to freely give you something that you don't deserve. But because of your insurance company, you would be called and your insurance would go up and then you would end up still paying for certain parts of it months and even years down the road. That's cheap grace, even though we would all still be happy if we received a little cheap grace if that officer handed us a Benjamin. Am I making sense? Jesus-style grace would be handing you the ticket. Officer Jesus is on the front of his jacket, and you look down at the ticket, and he says, I'm going to give you a ticket, but I'm also going to give you grace because somebody has to pay for the law that was broken. So I want you to look down at the ticket and see who it's made out to. And you would look down at the ticket, and to your amazement, it would read, Officer Jesus on the ticket, meaning that he, when he would say, take that to the courthouse, the judge is going to want to know who's going to pay for this crime. And you would look at him and go, are you for real? You are going to pay for all the sin that I committed? Why? 
And he goes, because that is grace, and I so desperately want to be in relationship with my people. And so Jesus comes to give us what we do not deserve, taking the payment, paying the judge, and all of the account thereafter so that your account is completely and utterly clean. Oh, it's not a good point to say amen, I know, because it's like, that doesn't make sense. Welcome to the gospel. It doesn't make sense. But you read this, and there is a man who loved us so much, who never broke the law, who went the speed limit every day, every week, every month, every year, and said, for all those who are going to break the law, I'm going to go to the cross and show grace so that when they come into relationship with me, it will be my name on their ticket. So when, G when the judge says, who's to pay for this? I'll stand in the gap so that they don't have to, and their account will be clean. That's why I preach like this, because grace, for it is by grace that you've been saved. It is by grace through faith that you've been saved. So here's where faith comes in. Who wouldn't want to follow that guy? I'm staring out the window with my hand on the steering wheel going, are you for real? Is this really how you work? But not only the next time that you break the law would I provide my name on your ticket, but the next time, and the next time, and the next time, and the next time. And eventually I just wonder, well, what if I stop breaking the law? Then what happens? And how does my life get better if I stop breaking the law and I try to get closer to him who hasn't broken the law and live like him? And then grace continually unfolds because grace just isn't paying for all the sins we committed. Grace is still, by definition, the freely given, unmerited favor and divine enablement by God to us on a consistent basis. I want to talk to you today under the subject titled, The Grip of Grace. The Grip of Grace. Jesus was the embodiment of this idea. And so Jesus rolls up into a town called Bethsaida. We just read it. He rolls up into a town called Bethsaida. Are you still with me this morning? I'm just checking. Are we all, are we all together? Okay. All right. He rolls up into a town called Bethsaida, which is interesting in and of itself because if you read the book of Matthew ver chapter 11, you'll, you'll find that he said, Woe to you, Bethsaida. You should repent, and he rebukes them as a whole town and says, I don't want to go back there. But by grace, he's drawn back to Bethsaida. And so he goes to Bethsaida, and the text tells us that some people bring a blind man, and they beg Jesus to touch him. Is that what the text says? Is that what we read? So they begged Jesus to touch him. Now, this is already one of my favorite parts, and I haven't even gotten warmed up yet. Because when, he's, when the group says, Jesus, we're begging you to touch this man. We're begging you that you would heal this man. We're begging you that you would lay your hands on him, and for whatever reason, there would be a supernatural transference of power that would cause him to see again. This is remarkable to me. Because Jesus was a rabbi. Rabbi defined means teacher. Okay? So rabbis teach. They communicate using words and examples and illustrations so that an audience might be able to hear those principles embedded in the illustrations and all of that and live differently based on the teachings of the rabbi. So why is it that the text does not say they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to teach him how to see? He's a rabbi by trade. I believe that this first verse of this scripture is to teach us how to be both and people because they knew something in the New Testament that we still have to believe in today, which is simply this that we have to have the teaching of the word of God sometimes 
but in other times, we need a touch from God himself. Whoo, I am a both and leader. I believe that there are things that a sermon you have to have and we have to talk about it. I also believe there are some things that a sermon can't fix. Blindness, we couldn't yell at that boy as loud as we wanted to and say, see. Just tell your optic nerve to start working and your rods and cones about green and red and blue and purple and Roy G. Biv, and, and they'll come to life. You can't teach him how to see. There's some things that you cannot teach that only a touch from God himself will fix. But if, if you stay over here and you're, you're, you're a person who's just always wanting an experience and a touch from God, you're just weird. But if you go over here and you're just infatuated with touch and intellectual, with teach and intellectualism and wanting to hear another deep philosophical principle and argue all of the ideas in the Bible, then you're just arrogant. And I believe that's where we look at Jesus and Jesus goes, I live in the middle. I believe that you need me to teach you some things and I believe you're going to need me to touch some things in your life. There are some things you're going to need to teach we can pray and pray and pray for your bank account to have more money in it at the end of this service, and you can pull out your phone, and you can go to your app, and you will see that it has not increased a dollar because we need to teach you how to be a better steward of your finances. Why? Because you cannot pray your way out of what you behave your way into. You have to be taught how to behave differently. But then there's some things that you know that even if we teach and we teach and we teach and we teach and we gather and we gather and we gather and we Sunday 52 times a year, it wouldn't make a difference. There's some things that only God can touch in your heart, in your soul. There's some things God wants to heal from when you were a child that we can't teach enough self-help psychology. Yesterday was Mental Health Awareness Day, and I'm all about mental health. I married a counselor. That's how much about mental health I am. But I believe God can do more in a moment than a counselor can do in 10 years. I believe that he can strip from you things that happen in your past, that he can heal certain things instantaneously just like that. I believe that when we walk with him, that he is the great counselor, that he builds rapport with us, and that he will reveal certain things in our hearts, our emotions, our minds, that he wants to touch for the rest of our lives so that we could be more like him. Y'all aren't talking to me now. Both and. Sometimes we need to be taught some things. Sometimes we need to have God touch certain things in our lives. It is by grace that he even allows any of this to happen. And so the blind man and Jesus have a moment. Now, if I am the people who bring the blind man to Jesus, I want to already highlight what we're seeing. They have to have some amount of that word that we've already talked about, which is faith. They, they have to have some amount of faith because they believe that this man's world could be changed after this one moment. And so they see that Jesus is coming and they experience faith, but they don't know what's going to happen. They're not sure what God is going to do in this blind man's life. We don't know the characters in the story, but it's evident and obvious that they could not be able to predict how the story is going to end. I think that's proof positive in the next verse. Because verse 23, let me show you verse 23 right here. Verse 23 says this. He took the blind man by the hand and he led him outside the village. Now, this does not make sense. There's a blind man, and there are some people who bring this blind man to Jesus. They ask him to heal the blind man. Jesus looks over their request and walks him outside the city. I, this is extremely wild to me because 
I, I don't want to insult Jesus' intelligence, but I just want to raise to the awareness level of consciousness for him that this man can't see. So why are we going to take a blind man outside of the village when he cannot see where he's going? I would imagine, which I can do quite well, that if you and I were blind, we probably have a system about how to move around our world, would we not? If I got to go to the john, I probably attached a rope to the stage and I can follow the rope on how to get there. If I need to go to the front door, I probably moved all the furniture out of the way so I don't hit my toes and my knees every time that I walk. If I need to know where the cereal is, I've created systems where I can feel my way around it. I've got a whole world created so that I can get to wherever it is I'm going. So I think that if we were to look at the inside of this blind man's emotions, I think it's evident that he has no idea where they are going. All we see is outside the village. He is not comfortable with wherever it is that Jesus is taking him. And he has no idea how to get back if he ever gets lost. And as I study this, I think that this verse is one of the most rich theological verses inside this passage because maybe the reason that Jesus is taking the man outside of the village is because he cannot see. Blindness is referred to as spiritual understanding. And I want to elevate to consciousness for you right now that our definition of faith, faith is is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things what? Unseen. And we're dealing with a blind man who can't see. Who can't see where he's going. Jesus, I don't know where we're going. I'm not comfortable with wherever it is you're taking me. And if you were to ever leave me, I wouldn't know how to get back. I don't know if we're talking about the blind man anymore. I think we might be talking about you. Have you ever been in a situation where you're looking at Jesus and he's trying to lead you somewhere outside of your comfort zone and you're going, Jesus, I don't know how to get wherever it is that you're taking me. I'm not all that comfortable going wherever it is that we're headed and I don't know how to get back if you ever walk away from my side. I believe this whole principle is what I call the grip of grace. Because he takes him by the hand. I love the way the verse is written. It can't be written any differently. He took the blind man by the hand. Wouldn't it be an evil verse if it was the blind man felt around for Jesus until he found Jesus' hand? But instead, it's Jesus initiating first. He took the blind man by the hand. Why? Because it is by grace through faith that you have been saved. It is freely given. Christianity does not start with a big do. Do something. Do this. Behave differently. Do that. It starts with a big done. It starts with what Jesus has already done. It is by grace that you've been saved. It is by grace on the cross. And so what Jesus has already done, the verse can't be written any differently. He took. He took. He went to the cross first. He initiated first before we would ever say yes to him. He started the relationship before we would ever say yes to him. He took the blind man by the hand. It's the grip of grace. This is a powerful illustration of grace and faith working hand in hand. You have to see that the blind man had some amount of faith. And hilariously, it's the evidence of things hoped for, things unseen. That's okay. I just want to remind you in the room that Jesus has got eyes. 
So if you can't see where you're going, just squeeze that hand. If you don't know where you're headed, just hold on tight. If you don't know where you're comfortable being at and Jesus is leading you for whatever reason outside of the village, you just continue to walk with him because he knows where it is that you're headed. He knows how to get you wherever you're going. We sing songs about, and I know you'll have the plans whenever I get there. I don't remember the lyrics, but that's close. It's the both and. It's, it's, it's Jesus being the leader that we want to follow because he can see what we cannot. It is grace on our life. It is grace, this freely unmerited favor given to us and the divine enablement of God himself. Just picture yourself. Eyes are closed, and all you've got is that hand. Is that 2020 in a nutshell? All you've got is that hand. You don't know how to get out of here. You don't know where you're going. But you know that Jesus is the one who's squeezing, saying, just follow me, follow me, follow me. I believe that this right here is a metaphor for what happens for the rest of our lives. Faith is simply the recipient. Faith is simply the vehicle. Faith is the container. Grace is where the gift is. If I had a, a, a vase of water, I couldn't just pour it out all over the ground and make a big mess. I would need a cup to put the water in, but it would start with the water, it wouldn't start with the cup. So grace needs a recipient called faith to be fully activated. You have to have faith to follow wherever it is that he's, that he's going. But grace is the initial mover that says, just take my hand, I'm right here. Am I making sense? So I don't know where you're going, I don't know what you're doing, I don't know what your life looks like, all I know is that Jesus has got your hand leading the way if you present that faith to him and you receive his grace and you walk with him. But I have a question. The man's still blind, and the purpose of him meeting Jesus was to be healed. Do you have the faith to walk out with Jesus even if he hasn't walked in on your situation? The man doesn't want to be blind forever, right? Right? But Jesus hasn't presented a healing yet. The first thing he says to do is, can you walk with me? Can you simply take my hand? We'll get to the healing later, but our problem is that we want God to show up and heal us first and we'll walk with him second. But I don't see God working like that throughout the scriptures. Can you give God your attention when the thing that you think needs his attention doesn't have it yet? Because God might just let you sit in it for a minute. God might just allow you to, uh, to let it play out. Because Paul said, I had this thorn in my fle flesh and I prayed for it three times and God wouldn't take it away. And he says, my grace is sufficient. Meaning my grace for me and your life will get you through that. Sometimes God leaves it alone because he says, I like what's happening to you. God, I've never been so scared. Yeah, but you've never prayed this hard. God, I don't know where I'm going, and I've never had this much anxiety. Yeah, but you've never followed me this closely before. God, I don't know how to get out of this on my own. Yeah, but you haven't talked to me this consistently in five years. I'm going to leave the blindness for a minute so that you can follow me where I'm Come on. Sometimes he leaves it. Sometimes he just lets it sit. Will you go with him outside the city? Will you follow him, terrified, shaking and all, even if he hasn't answered the one prayer that you wished he would? I'm going to leave that alone right there because it's getting too heavy for me. I'm up here already starting to sweat. Now, Mark 8, 23, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm assuming that we appear um, outside the city. It's all we got. Don't know what else is out there. All I know is that we're there. And the next verse says, when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked a funny question. Do you see anything? Now, if somebody hawks a loogie and shoots it into my eyeballs, 
and asked me, do I see anything? My answer would probably see, be, well, I don't know. I might have, but things are a little blurry now because the saliva is translucent. When he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him, and Jesus asked, do you see anything? The question here, I think, becomes, and I've, 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 I've followed Jesus a minute, and I'm, as I studied this scripture and tried to, tried to pull out different things that I think are there in the text, I think the question here becomes, can you trust God even when he doesn't do something that you think he would do? Can you still trust God? Do you see anything? This whole experience here is very interesting about spit and all this, and there's several reasons that it might have happened. We're really unsure when we just study the text and we go into the context of the ancient Near East and we try to pull out what, what, what was this all about. There's a few reasons that we kind of come to, and here's what I've got for you today because I believe that I need to preach to you what's, what's there. I think, why does Jesus spit on the man's eyes? One interpretation is this. It's because he wants to get the DNA that's in his saliva in the man's tear ducts because Jesus' DNA is perfect, without sin, never been tainted, and when it comes into his tear ducts, that physically he's providing his own DNA for this man to soak up and to have a optic nerve healing. I love that interpretation. I really do. Is it because that he wants to use the substance that comes from the mouth that has never uttered a lie and wants to reverse the blindness through using spit from the mouth of truth? The mouth of truth. I don't know, that's the second interpretation. The third is, quite simply, the hornet's nest is back. I'm sorry. For those who are online, you don't hear this, but it is coming a torrential downpour here. The third interpretation is this, that it was a common practice in their culture, cultural belief that saliva was used as an agent for healing. Now, quite frankly, I don't really know exactly which one of these it is, and it might be all of them at work at the same time, but here's what I know is this. When it comes to Jesus, expect the unexpected. When it comes to Jesus, I think we could all agree that this man didn't see it coming. <laughs> quite literally. But he has to expect the unexpected. You have to expect the unexpected when you can't see. You're following Jesus by faith. His grace is leading you along the way. He might do some things that are interesting for you. He might do some things that you didn't expect. God, I didn't expect you to show up in 2020 like this. I thought we were going to be across the street in the middle school. Jesus said, exactly. I do things that you don't expect me to do. I beat to my own drum. I'm, I'm follow, you're following me. I'm leading the way. And we have to expect the unexpected when it comes to following Jesus. Next verse, he says, he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. He, he looks up, blind man, to respond to Jesus, do you see anything? And he says, I see people. They look like trees walking around. A blind man is asked the question, do you see anything? He looks up and he says, I see people. They look like trees walking around. I have a question. If this man has been blind his whole life, how does he know how to articulate what trees look like I believe that if you look at what's going on here that at one point this man had his sight and somewhere along the course of his journey he lost it that at some point in his story there was a moment where he could see 
And now, as he's sitting here, he's seeing again for the first time. So there is a time period in between the moment he could see and the moment he's seeing now for the first time in years where there's a spiritual blindness, a moment of blindness, a physical ailment that took place. And because as I look at that and study it, I would like to ask that man, what happened to you that caused you to lose your sight? Was it an injury? Was it disease? Was it, what happened? Because the word that tells me for sure that he used to have it is that verse 25 says his sight was restored. Restored. His sight was restored. Meaning that at one point he could see and something happened no longer good. So I was restored. But since I can't ask him what happened to him to lose his sight, I figured I'd just ask you, is there anything that at one point in your life that you could see? And there's something that happened by injury that you can't see anymore. Not the way you used to. Not how it used to look. Did you have a vision for your life? Did you, did you see something that you, 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 you saw happening that, that you believed and you prayed and you fasted and you felt that God was going to do something? Did you see something and something caused you to lose your sight? So you can't, you can't talk about having faith without first dealing with disappointed faith. Disappointment will sink into your bones and it will rot things out of your life. God, I thought, I felt, I thought you said, I thought you were going to, I thought it was gonna and it didn't and I'm disappointed. And there is a point in time where we, we walk blind. But faith and grace are at play. Help me, Holy Spirit. I want to show you how good God is. I want to, I want to show you how powerful this passage really is. Jesus is full of grace. It's, it's him who extends it. It's, it's him who freely gives. It's, it's him who always has it. And he's so good that the verse can't be written any differently than the way it's written. In verse 25, verse 25, he says, I see people that look like trees, meaning I don't see like I know I should see, meaning it's not perfect, meaning if it's not done yet, God's not done yet. Meaning when Jesus says it is finished, it really was finished. So if he sees people that look like trees, he doesn't see people that look like people. Meaning he needs Jesus to touch him again. He needs a subsequent touch from God. He needs God to show up one more time because it hasn't been finished yet. And I want to show you in verse 25 the way that grace works, the way that grace is presented in our lives. Verse 25 says two words. What are the first two words? We'll all say it together. The first two words, once more. Say it again. Once, one more time. Once more. Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Once more, Jesus touches the man, and the verse finishes by saying, and his sight was restored, his eyes were open, and he saw everything clearly. Listen to me. Do you have the ability to be honest with Jesus when he says, do you see anything? And you say, I see stuff but it doesn't look right. I see stuff, but I've got faith that you can do 
more than what I'm seeing now because when you put your faith into motion, your feelings will follow. Like a locomotive with train cars attached, the cars have to follow the locomotive wherever it goes. Nobody cares about your future more than God does. Nobody. And grace is the thing that always says once more. If grace ever ran, ran out, it wouldn't be grace. If grace ever had a stopping point, it wouldn't be limitless. It wouldn't be unconditional. It wouldn't be able to have a, a unlimited bank account. Once more, faith, grace. Once more, Jesus touched the man. Once more, Jesus showed up. I believe God wants to have a once more moment with you. I've talked to the best of my ability about this two-handed thing called faith and grace, and now I just need God to show up and touch certain people right there at your seat. If you need a once more touch from God, God, I used to, but I don't anymore. I used to feel it, but I can't anymore. I need a once more touch from God. Once more, I believe all you have to do is ask and say, God, it doesn't look right. God, I'm not seeing the way I used to see. I want you to restore to me the faith I used to have. And by grace, that's freely extended. It never stops, it never runs out. It is once more, it's over and again. And he has another touch for you this morning. Would you stand to your feet?